This may seem like a really silly question, but where did the audacity come from to create a new comics universe? Um, so I work for Lion Forge Comics, and the owner of the company, David Stewart II, and the chief creative officer, um, Carl Reed, came up with the notion of doing another superhero universe. They were um, quite inspired by Milestone, and in particular, Static Shock. And so when the company you know, really went through a major evolution and wanted to take things to the next level with its business, um, they came to me because of my time working at Milestone, working on Batman. Um, I've been an advocate for diversity in comics, um, behind the scenes, with the characters, with the creators for years and they told me what they wanted to do. And you know, a number of people would say, well, you're just committing suicide. You're gonna create a, another superhero universe and there's Marvel and DC. And I was like, bring me in. I'm excited, because people will tell you it's impossible. And I'm like, no, we're going to do the impossible. And so their audacity um, really activated my super audacity. And, um, that's how we got it started. That was the very beginning, and there were different stages to it. Um, once we really got it together, then what I felt was necessary was to get the right writers on board, because everything starts with story. Once you can establish the overarching story, then you can start bringing in the other creators, the artists, the letterers, the colorers. So I took a nod from television and created the Catalyst Prime Writer's Room. So if you think about your favorite television shows, all of them have writer's rooms, they have a showrunner, you sit down around a table for days and weeks and you figure out a season. And so I brought together a team of writers that included Brandon and David here. Um, we also had Christopher Priest, one of the original founders of Milestone in the mix, so I felt that that was um, quite thematically poetic. Um, we had um, Joe Casey, we had Amy Chu, we had Dr. Sheena Howard, um, and then Ramon Govea, who co-created one of the titles, and Alex DeCampi was the last writer that came on board. And we sat down for two days and we figured out the first year of Catalyst Prime and we created the Catalyst Prime Bible which at that time was a 50 page document about all the characters and the world and the universe. And it's now probably about 110 pages. Yeah. So um, how did you latch on this vision and wanted to be a part of it? I mean, because I can think a new venture can be really super scary, right? You're like, you know, there's a lot of media. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what we get more brought well, you on board? It was, it, it was crazy for me because um, he, he came to me and he asked me if I wanted to write the first book out, the book that comes out on, because uh, uh, the universe kind of launched on free comic book day. So it was um, the, this one shot that I think Joe's going to give away at the end. And uh, the first issue of the title I write, uh, Noble. So it was a little, uh, it was very exciting. It was pretty easy to say yes to. And then after that, it was like, oh man, I got the first book. Like, oh. <laughs> Oh man, what I'm gonna do? But it was uh, it, it was exciting. I mean, it's it's always when whenever you start a a new book, there's always uh, that period of time where you're uh, kind of terrified about what it's gonna. My 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 concern is always when am I gonna figure it out? Because you know the the honest truth is that sometimes you don't figure the book out like on the first script. Sometimes it it takes to the second or the third. Twenty fifth. So, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you. You may feel like you never, you know, quite figure it out. So my my goal with Noble was to um, deliver something that was for me, you know, something that uh, that had the kind of kind of widescreen, high stakes action that I loved in comics, but putting brown people in it. Because when I look at books like that, when I look at books like, you know, The Authority, Planet, Planetary is a little better because, you know, we have um, J Jaquita, Jaquita Wagner. Jaquita yeah. Wagner is in it. But a lot of these, you know, if you look at kind of the, the kind of great, com the comics that are considered to be 
the greatest that have ever been produced, there's not a lot of brown people in them. So my goal was to uh, produce a comic like that, that operated on that kind of epic level. But it had people of color, you know, featured prominently. So it was, uh, you know, I think we did a pretty, I think we did a pretty good job. I'm proud of the, the work that we've done with Noble, but it was a little uh, terrifying to go out first. <laughs> yeah, I kind of gave you some rough marching orders. I was like, Bitch slap Superman <laughs> and use Mark Millar and Brian Hitch as the ultimates as your starting point. Yeah. And then yep. go further than that. Yes. Yep. No, that's not like that tall of an order. Yeah, I know. I'm right. No. Right. Uh, you know, for me, it was Joe, Joe reached out to me and, you know, there was, was part of me was like, uh, you know, another superhero line. Uh, like, is it? Not only does the world need this, does the um, is the market going to embrace this? So I, I was a little, you know, I was I wasn't like I was like, okay, this will be cool, maybe. Um, and then Joe said, well, you know, I, I, if you're interested, we I'd like you to co-write it. We've got Sheena Howard on board, and I was like, oh, okay, well, that was superb, right? Yeah, that was on superb. Um, I was like, well, we definitely need more. Uh, women and women of color writing in the industry and we need to get help them break out of the the indie DIY world which is where most of them exist right now and so I was like okay well that's your scoring points there and then he said the the team is about two superheroes and one of them has down syndrome and I said okay I'm on board and and the reason I said okay I'm on board was because I felt like <clears throat> I did not want to see a comic with a character who had Down syndrome done wrong, and if it was gonna be d done wrong, let it be done by me trying my hardest to do it right. And you worked with the National Down Syndrome Foundation on the book, right? Yes, we, they, they, they came on board and partnered up, but even before that had happened, I, I had agreed to do it. And, and because to me, not only was that a challenge, but it was like, I started thinking about, when I talk about the importance of, of representation and inclusion to me in comics, a lot of times as I'm talking about that, I'm talking specifically about black folks, and it's like it needs to be more than that, um, because we can't, if, if all we're doing is just black folks, there's still a whole lot of other people we're leaving out. And, and again, the challenge of writing a character like Jonah, that's the name of the character in Superb, was so intimidating and so daunting to me that I, I couldn't say no. And he's become one of my favorite characters to write, period, of all the characters I've, I've written at this point in my career. So he's really, and, and the, the best part is I've done some events with, in conjunction with the National Down Syndrome Society, uh, helped teach a comic book writing class for a group of kids with Down Syndrome, and met all these families and kids, and it's, it's like, well, this is what it's all about. Like, it's not so much about, you know, getting rich, because you don't get rich writing comics. Sorry, sorry to burst everyone's all bubble out there. Like, everyone's, yeah, everyone gets up and leaves the room. What, we don't get rich? What, where's Please that don't all Panther start money? leaving now that you've heard that terrible truth. <laughs> but yeah, it just, I wanted to be part of something that, um, not to say it hasn't been done before, but that hasn't been done on this level with this level of representation and, and really feel like, like you're, you're, you're putting your money where your mouth is because you can pound your fist and on the table and say diversity and representation and inclusion mean so much to me. And then if you don't do anything about it, then it doesn't actually mean anything to you. You're just, you're just paying lip service. Oh, me too. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, from the get-go, when I first got the pitch from Joe, it was just an exciting prospect. You know, no didn't really cross my mind. Um, I don't really operate in the superhero comics world too much. Uh, it's, so you know, like, superhero comics, as we covered, they're not very diverse, you know. There's really not a space there for black women. Um, or black girls. And there's not a very huge space for kids and teens, which is kind of where I operate. You know, I'm a children's book author and illustrator. And back in the day, most comics were all ages. You know, they were geared toward kids, but that's not so much the case anymore. So, you know, while I grew up on titles like X-Men and Batman, and I still have a lot of love for them, 
that's not really what informs my work now. But when Joe reached out to me, told me about Superb, which you know I did a few covers for. Um, Dope covers, I might add. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it was something new. It was a story focused on diversity from the ground up. These were characters that the world has not seen before. And they were teens. And, you know, all of that is just totally within my wheelhouse. It was intimidating because I really haven't done comic covers, and especially not superhero comic covers before. But it was an exciting opportunity to do something new. So, yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was important to... Um, as David said, bring more black women into the mainstream um, North American comic book space with this line. And like Nyla and I have a secret origin that goes back to a few years when she was the first um, award winner of the Dwayne McDuffie Award. Um, Dwayne McDuffie um, was one of the founders of Milestone, um, a friend and a mentor to me. So, um, I really felt like her work with MFK um, spoke to where he wanted comics to go. And um, her artwork is really exquisite. And with the second season of the Catalyst Prime titles, we decided to bring on guest cover artists. So when we were thinking about people, I was like, okay, this is a perfect sync up. And I asked her and she said yes, and we were off to the races. and. The thing about, especially the next cover, like superb number seven, when you see this cover, um, I'll kind of describe it to you because it won't, <laughs> still won't be as cool as when you see it. But it's basically like the two kids. So Kayla um, is a black girl and Jonah, the kid with Down syndrome, is white. And they're basically standing in front of this wall. And, you know, one of them is like listening to like, their iPhone, another one's just like looking through a comic book, and they're standing in front of a poster that has them in their superhero um, identities, and they're like wanted. I so it's kind of like this, this double layer concept, <laughs> right? And so you actually get the superhero um, vision, and you get the vision of real teenagers at the same time. And I think there is a dichotomy of how teenagers feel in real life right, where there's the part of you that you show the world, and then there's a part of you that is your secret identity, which is kind of like where your pain and your fears lie, right? And just the multiple contexts of those exactly. things Exactly, so like when you see this cover, it's hot. And it's thematic, and it's the kind of cover you're not gonna see from these other companies because they're not dealing with these social issues and dichotomies that we as people of color have to deal with every waking minute of our lives. And there's one thing about the idea of diversity in um, Catalyst Prime Lion Forge, it's that it was never the Negro woman queer of the week like Marvel and DC was doing, <laughs> right? It was always just like, look, we are being diverse right now. Can't you tell? <laughs> and yours is- a, I don't know just, what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I resemble you, that remark. Like, that's, I mean, because it's, for you, it seems like in, in what you, the work that you're doing, that diversity is an is. Yeah. It's not an event. It's not a, a somersault through flames. It's an is. This is how the world actually looks. Mm -hmm. We're going to actually make this world the world that we, we live in. Mm -hmm. And so, but with all of the um, trolley pushback of, of called diverse, I mean, even, I even hate the word diverse. It's like the real world. Mm -hmm. um, how do you negotiate and navigate some of the, um, our uh, baser comic friends who may be out there on Twitter and Facebook and the rest railing against you damn social justice warriors. You know, what's the opposite of a social justice warrior here? <laughs> Someone social who doesn't injustice give a damn warrior. Social yeah, so sure. yeah, that but that I mean, literally warrior. what it I mean, is. Think about it, we live in a world where Friends and Seinfeld is the default, but living single is a black show. 
Right. right, right, right. And so how do you, I mean, so, but you are creating a new default and how do you do it? So A, you're not pandering. Right. And then also still having to, you know, Bob and we even defend yourself against the um, Tiki <laughs> Torch Khaki Brigade. Yeah, you know, it, <laughs> wow, wow. Well, David has some personal experience. <laughs> uh, just one or two. If you ever, ever want to see misery in action, look at the people who comment on David Walker's Twitter feed. Wow. I mean... Yeah, with Catalyst Prime, you know, I did this interview in which I basically said, diversity is easy, racism is hard, right? Because it takes effort to leave out all of the creators <laughs> who are not white, heterosexual males with all working limbs. That takes work. It doesn't take work to say, I want to get together a group of creators and then just look at the best creators in comics because a number of them are women, a number of them are people of color, a number of them are not cisgender or heterosexual. And not American. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it was like putting together the team was actually easy and... In terms of dealing with the trolls, like there's this amazing thing. It's called a block option. <laughs> Actually, mute is better. Mute, because mute. They don't know. They you don't know you that's, muted that's them. That's true. That's and then true. they're just screaming into, into the um, I don't. I don't mind them knowing that I'm blocking them. It's kind of like that episode of Black Mirror, <laughs> where like you know I can no longer see your features anymore. You're now just a silhouette in Archangel. society. Yeah, Oof. it's like it's like Archangel. So I don't mind them knowing because honestly, like we're not gonna move this world forward engaging in meaningless conversations full of bile. Yeah, I don't have the time for it. We do not have the time for it. For one of the things for me, and I, I've said this multiple times over the years, there's there's diversity with a lowercase d, and that is the catchphrase that has been used a lot, and it's really just it's it's um it's another word for marketing, right? It's a it's another word for how do we sell this, how do we how do we sell something other than the the white heteronormative male concept in pop culture, right? But then there's diversity with a capital D. Diversity with a capital D is this room right now. Diversity with a capital D is this city that we're in. It's the it's it's lots of parts of this country, not all parts of this country, but it's also the ideology by which some of us choose to live. And it's which it's that ideology that says, you know, my friends are my friends and I'm not going to go out of my way, like you were talking about, like to just only surround myself with one type of person who thinks one sort of way. And and that's what I've tried to commit myself to the work that I do. And, and it's not easy. We were having this conversation last night just about, you know, I'm old, right? You know, so I, I grew up in an era where, you know, you would, I would watch movies as a kid that when I go back and watch them now, I'm like, yo, there's, there's no women in the, this movie. Like, or there is, but she gets killed and she's the whole reason Charles Bronson goes on the killing rampage. You know what I'm saying? They're, they, they, they have no agency and no humanity about them. And, and sometimes I'll be working on a script and I'll catch myself and I'll see, oh, you've done this. And the reason you've done this is because this is what you were weaned on. This is how you, this is what you know. You have to turn it around. And I've gotten much better at it, but I'm still, we're all still guilty of these, of these isms that get ingrained in us subconsciously through our, through society, through and the world we live in. Yeah, and reinforced. So what are you going to do about it? And, and if somebody calls you on it and, and it all, and I, I tell people all the time, you feel free to call me on it. Just try to be as polite as humanly possible because I'm not nice and I will, I'm bitter and I'll start yelling <laughs> and then I'll usually go home and mope and be like, they were right. They, <laughs> damn it. I am a, not a very good writer and blah, blah, blah. so, but yeah. But it's just it's it, you can engage like a rational human being, and that's a then that's a beautiful thing. I mean, like you're talking about diversity, and like prison yards are diverse. They just don't <laughs> connect and talk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, prison yards are mighty, but there's little islands yes. here. And so when you're, I mean, you know, I mean, over this past week, I've been going to all, most comic shops in the Bay, talking about BCAF, talking to people in, the, in, the, in shops, telling me about this, and the look on their faces 
Black Comics Arts Festival. Yeah. And even the shop, which I should, I should, I won't name them. Never mind. But even um, shop owners were just like, um, but but that's not very inclusive. I'm like, did you see your entire shelves? Yeah. <laughs> you know. But then having to understand like why a festival like this is necessary. Why at the Schomburg this weekend is necessary. Why the Latino Arts Explosion is necessary. Why the Queer Comics Festival is necessary. But having to fight against that, and I've realized my own biases and how times I'm then I'm like questioning myself. I'm like, wait a minute. We aren't inclusive, but yeah, we are. I mean, having to struggle with these with these things. So, how do you negotiate that stuff when your stuff comes up during the process of you know doing a cover? Like, I don't know your, your experience with somebody with with a, with a disability, with Down syndrome, but then you have to draw this person. Like, how much of the stuff your stuff do you confront while you're producing? Um. So my tactic is just listen and listen very closely to people who know better about those subjects than I do. Um, I am not the authority on what like disabled characters look like or what their experience is like, so I need to get feedback from people who are who live uh, that who live that experience. And you know, it, part of the reason I signed on to this was because you know the character of Jenna was. Just it, his uh, Down syndrome was not just an added, you know, characteristic. Like they were getting feedback from uh, from experts, and so you know, I knew that they that Lion Forge had, uh, you know, they had experts on the line that I could trust with this, um, even. You know, as an artist and writer, like my experiences, my experience as an individual, you know, I can't even speak for every black woman's experience. So when it comes to. You can't. What? I've tried, <laughs> but no, no, I can't. And so, you know, for me, it's just, it's just about listening. Um, and you know, with you know, with regards to diversity, uh, you know, I still use that word because it's easy shorthand, and people usually understand what you mean. But lately, I've I've been um, kind of getting more in tune with the eye of the idea of don't diversify, don't diversify, uh, diversify, decolonize. And so, yeah. you know, right now, some of these bigger companies they get really focused on uh, you know diversity on the page. And what we really need more of is uh, more voices behind the page. What? You know, that's Matt Damon. No, you didn't. Lion Forge. Whoa. <laughs> I also uh, every time Marvel announces that they uh, found like a new black writer and that they're writing Black Panther, I want to break every window in my house. <laughs> And it, it happens, I'm like, this is, this is gonna be the last time. This is gonna be the last time. And these are great writers, people that I know, people whose work that I respect greatly. And I'm by all of it, obviously, but it, it really grinds, it really grinds me that, you know, Marvel will go and they will find, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, we're gonna go find poets, we're gonna go find screenwriters, we're gonna go find bloggers. And, Every single one of them is writing Black Panther, and that's the only thing that Black people are allowed to How many write. Stories that brother has at Marvel. Like. Well, he's got a movie coming, so we got to yeah. get that. Got a marketing machine. Yeah, we got to get that uh, that ancillary material out there. But you know, that kind of lack of imagination is uh, lack of editorial imagination is why Catalyst Prime is necessary and why it exists. And the fact that they don't see that. You know, I, I mean, why, why do I have to scream about that on Twitter? Like, yeah. wh why can't Marvel realize, like, oh, so what are we saying? We finally go out and find, you know, five or six black writers, and they're all writing Black Panther miniseries? Like, how, how does that work? So, you know, th it's well, one of the reasons why we need Catalyst Prime. Like, you're going to get industry. Wolverine Blake, you jive, turkey. Whoosh. Like, you know, right, I mean, right. Like, no, no, no. But that that that's what it is. A lot of these uh, these editor, you know, and Joe can speak I'm to still it. in that idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I work with a, you know, I work with an editor at a at another company, a company called uh, Skybound, and uh, I tell him that, you know, it's like 
I am joking a little bit with this, but I'm not, but he is the first white editor that I've worked with that hasn't been afraid of me and like the story that I might tell. And I don't mean like afraid of me, I mean like, you know, like, what's he gonna say? What's gonna be no, in the book? They're afraid of me. <laughs> well, so, they should, well, they should be. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but, I'm, but I'm a, you know, it, it's gentle as a yeah. Sometimes as a razor blade. Yes. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but uh, but this is one of the reasons why Callus Prime is is so important, and why it's so important to get people of color and women working behind the scenes because they can find, you know, they can find every black writer in America and put them on Black Panther books and it's not going to, that's not what the issue is. The issue is not that, you know, white people write Black Panther and they shouldn't be allowed to. It's the fact that they can't find a black screenwriter and give them, you know, the non-black character. It's yeah. Like, why weren't you writing Iron Fist after Power Man and Iron Fist ended? To me, that would have been a lot more clever than just because I'm not a white guy who's an expert in martial arts. That's why. <laughs> right. So um, I feel like that's not the problem. Oh, is but... that not it? Um, and the thing is, you know, like Catalyst Prime is an example of the philosophy of Lion Forge as a publisher. You know, Lion Forge believes in comics for everyone. If you look at the staff of Lion Forge. There are more women than there are men. The highest editorial authority in the company, the vice president, executive editor of Lion Forge is a woman. I can't think of any other comic book publisher in the North American market that you can say that about. So. 20s. 18. Yeah, you know, so. Even media companies in general a lot of the right. times. Yeah. So the philosophy of this superhero science fiction line is a representation of the philosophy of the publisher. And, you know, with diversity, there's this crazy misnomer, there's this misconception that diversity means anti-white. Diversity is everybody. We have white creators at Catalyst Prime. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no. artists, writers, letters, <laughs> colors, yes, of course. <laughs> and um, because not the point is that all of the lines don't have to be straight. It's not white writer, white character, woman writer, woman character. Um, we have a character astonisher, um, male character, kind of like our cross between um, Bruce Wayne, Tony Stark, and Doctor Strange, written by a woman. Why specifically? Because I was tired of seeing characters like that from the male gaze. And I was like, I want to see how a how a woman would tackle Tony Stark or Bruce Wayne or Doctor Strange, you know? And it's as simple as just making that decision, like the status quo is not satisfactory. Make the opposite decision. And enough of those opposite decisions will change the status quo in time. And it's also about ca uh, with um, Lion Forge in general, it's pretty interesting because you have Cub House mm -hmm. section, which is for the little kids, and then you have Roar, which is what gets teen right, level. Right, like the YA line. And then you have the Catalyst Prime, which is like the superhero line. Right, right? and then we also have the Magnetic, Magnetic Collection, Collection, which are um, beautifully illustrated graphic novels from talent overseas. So that brings the global um, perspective um, to the North American space. And you know, another reason Nyla and I connected was because of the MFK webcomic that you did, which just got put into a beautiful hardcover volume, which you can find at Barnes and Noble, right? Yes. Right? And that book is so dope. dope. That's the next step. It the is. next step is dope. being able to find the books where all of you go, because all of you may not have the map of the comic book stores, but you certainly know where to find BNN. You certainly know where to find BNN.com. And so that greater expansion and the opportunity to get our stories to the larger audience is important. So being able to take like the comic books and have them is great and then collect the comic books in volumes and have them in the bookstores is even better. And so Catalyst Prime isn't just an imprint, it's actually a universe, right? It is, it is. It's a universe, there are seven monthly titles um, we launched last year, we started with um, a free comic book 
um, the first Saturday of every May in the comic book um, industry, there's something called Free Comic Book Day. And what Lion Forge wanted to do as a publisher is to say, okay, why don't we allow people to enter this world for free? No strings attached. And if you like it, come back and then pay for it. <laughs> and if you pay for it, you'll get your money's worth. So um, Christopher so you Priest- used the, used the dope dealer uh, thing, didn't you? That's, that's that, that, uh, okay, just check. <laughs> that is one potential analogy, yeah. <laughs> Never even thought about it until just now. Very good, very ex good. Ex ex except this is the drug that actually is nourishing. Yes. A smart drug. <laughs> yes, yes. And so um, we worked together with um, two artists, one who lives in Brooklyn, one who lives in Italy, um, Jessica Colleen, an amazing colorist. She's in Indonesia. Um, the main character of the story is a Mexican female billionaire named Lorena Payan. And so just by the first book, you read this and you're like, Oh, this is not what I've seen before. It's like a billionaire scientist in Chiapas, I'm down right? for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we, this, the story started in Chiapas, Mexico, right? Because, you know, think global, produce global, <laughs> right? And a lot of the comic books in the North American space only take place within our shores. And it's like the world is huge. <laughs> and, you know, I came in on a plane this morning and I was watching a few episodes of Queen of the South. And first of all, I, I love Alice Braga. Mm. And secondly, Queen of the South was actually a little bit of the origin for Lorena Payan because um, David Stewart II, the CEO and owner of the company and I were talking and we were talking about, okay, who's the going to be the wealthy influencer of this world? And we were like, not a white man, not gonna do that. Got enough of that. <laughs> we were like, okay, let's figure it out. And he was like, Mexican? I was like, woman? He was like, go. I was like, okay. <laughs> and we'll be giving out copies of that for everyone afterwards, and you can read it, and you can let us know what you think. And it seems like it's not that hard. Like you were saying earlier, just if you just get the people who are doing the hottest work together in the room that you can create. <laughs> you can, Brandon's, just, Brandon's just like, I've been here, how long is finally happening? <laughs> so, I mean, so for any creators, are, are there any creators in the room? So for creators in the room, what would you give them uh, advice? What would you, what would you, what's up Stacey? What would you do um, to tell them? Like, to, if they wanted to go from the ground up to start their own vision, to actually put their vision, their story in the world, because we are story people and story is necessary. Oh, okay. But most of us are, huh? I'll tackle that one. All right, go you're, ahead. You're a professor Damn. now, right? Yes. 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 Um, well, first, the first and foremost, is, as I would say, is, you know, try to find, find that story that you want, Hi. but you're not finding. <laughs> And, and by that, I don't mean the Spider-Man story that you're not finding or the Aquaman story you're not finding. I'm just talking about a story that you're not finding, themes that aren't being tackled the way you want them tackled or characters that you're not seeing and then to be, begin to build it from there. And, and you don't have to be tied into just super, it doesn't ha just have to be superheroes because the beautiful thing about comics or graphic novels, whatever you want to call it, is there's no limits to the, to the genres and the sort of stories that you can tackle. It could be your own life. Uh, you know, in the, in the other room over there, they have uh, the, the exhibit of First Seconds, which was some of the most amazing graphic novels being produced right now. In most of it, I don't think any of it's actual traditional superhero stuff, but it's, a, it's, a, it's all amazing. Um, and, and the thing is, is the, the threshold, the entry level threshold for comics is actually really, really low. All you need is a piece of paper and some sort of writing implement. And it can be a pencil or a pen or a marker or like a piece of charcoal or chalk and you draw on the paper some sort of stick figure with some words saying hello and boom, you have just created your first comic. It's really that simple. And you, you don't need permission from anybody. You don't need, um, there, there's no secret tool. That's one of the things my students are always like, well, well, what sort of software do you use to write? And I tell them, well, I use my brain and my fingers. And then whatever tool I can get my hands on, whether it's the computer or a pad of paper, that's what I write on. But I, I don't need final draft or word or any of that sort of stuff. Um, 
You know, and people say, well, I, I can't draw. And I'm like, yeah, neither can I. But I can draw stick figures, and that's all you need to know how to do. But the thing is, is, is you, you have to have a story to tell. And there has to be something inside of you that you want to get out. And, and it really does need to be more than a recycling of, well, I can do Harry Potter better than Harry Potter, so I'm going to write my own Harry Potter book. A Harry Potter book's already been written. You don't do that. Give us what you think is is something that you would absolutely want to read. And if all you want to read is this particular Flash story, then I would say that you probably, and this is harsh, this is going to be a harsh thing, then what you have to say is not that important. If, if the only way you can tell your story is through Aquaman, are there kids in the audience? <laughs> Okay, yeah. one. Okay, if the only I'm, way I'm if, like right if, here, if, son. If, if the only way you can tell your story is through Aquaman, you are a shitty writer. Boom! I said it. That's it. You can leave the room right now. But if you can find a way to tell your story through, you know, Aquafina, the underwater lady. You know what I'm saying? There, you find a way to make it work. So. <laughs> Oh, Aquafina is a company, isn't it? Yeah. Damn, I thought that was and a, a, that's, that's that's water. An Asian, and an Asian woman no. rapper. And so I David was, has thought, just <laughs> led you to a lawsuit. Right. No. Right. I thought that was such a dope name. And then all the lawyers and all the lawyers in the audience are like, we're about to get paid. Or you right could, now. Uh, to use Aquafina. Or you contact the company and get sponsorship. <laughs> ah. Ah. There you go. <laughs> so we're about to um, wrap up and have audience questions, but one I would do want to, I mean, because like, I work with a lot of young people, and I've, I did 20 years of adolescent mental health and juvenile justice work, and I always use speculative fiction and comic books in my work with students because um, young black and brown queer Asian people are always vilified in ways, and so there's a lot of imposter syndrome when it comes to come out of their, of their negative deficit-based context, right? So how do you as creators who've been, you know, marginalized every possible, whether it's gender, color, the intersection of gender and color, sexuality, whatever it is, how do you defeat your imposter syndrome and then also invite people who may look like you and have a certain ethnic or cultural affinity with you? How do you bring them in to let them know that what everybody else said about you doesn't matter what matters is you belong here right now? Wow. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not smart enough to answer that one. Come on, so. come on Nyla, kick it off. <laughs> no, I, I was actually hoping David would take that first. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> um, I, can, I can, you want it? Well, okay, I, I'll jump into it, which okay. is that, um, first off, all any of us, every single person in this room, all we are, are the stories that we tell. And, when, and beyond that, we are the stories that are told about us. Okay, that's all we are. And everybody has a right to tell their story and everybody has a right for their story to be told. Now how you tell it or who tells it, that's up to you, but you begin to work from there. We all deserve to be seen. We all be, deserve to be seen as human beings, which is what we are. And there's nothing, I always go back to this, there's nothing worse than the feeling that I had when I was 10 years old and I went and saw Superman the movie with Christopher Reeve, and I was like totally into the movie and I was feeling it, and then the only black character in the entire movie showed up, and he was a pimp, and it was in all of Metropolis, there was only one black person, and he was a pimp, and I'm 10 years old, and I remember thinking, well shit, I would rather have an all white Metropolis than have this. <laughs> and, and, and so one of my goals one day is to convince DC to let me write the story of that pimp of from the pimp. Superman the movie <laughs> yes. and be like, yes. this is what it's really about, right? But, it's but really I, Black Panther. No, yeah, yeah. Um, but, it's, it, but, but the thing is, is um, I believe that, you know, day after day, week after week, century after century, many of us, are, our humanity has been... Um, has been taken away, they attempt to take away our humanity, they attempt to dehumanize us. It's not up to them to give us back our humanity, the people who, who try to take it from us. It's up to us to assert it and to claim it, and that's what we're doing, and that's what I encourage young people to do. I'm like, stand up for yourself and show that you're a human being. What does that mean? Tell us who you are. Find a way to, because all comic books are, they're myth, mm. and myth is, is humanity's way of expressing our place within existence. And we all have a right 
to have our own myth. We all have the right to have our own story and that thing that speaks for us. And if it's universal enough, if there's enough true humanity in that, people from all walks of life will be able to relate to it. It's why we were talking about, I think this morning, Sherman Alexie's book, uh, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, is the, is the single best book I've read in 20 years. And it's like, I've never, I didn't live on a reservation, I didn't experience anything that the character experienced, but it was the most human book I've ever read. It's the only book I've read that I've cried out loud and laughed out loud and given copies to every single person I know. And that's what we should be striving for, is to reclaim that humanity because it's not theirs to take it's ours to give up and they will they will fight you and try to kill you to take it from you but that's it if you want my humanity you are going to physically have to kill me because you can't emotionally or spiritually kill me I won't let you do it so I'll say that and walk out and someone's gonna shoot me out there in the street but <laughs> yeah what's up I don't oh, care that out there. <laughs> tweet, tweet, I, I'm here <laughs> right now <laughs> The last David Walker panel. <laughs> Nyla will protect me. Uh, so, um, I think all of that was excellent and hard to follow up. So, I'm, I'm going to follow up with a story. So, when I was four, I think, one morning I walked into my pre-kindergarten class and I was like the first student and the teacher and the teacher's assistant had put up this new display. And it was two kids, it was this white boy and this white girl. And the teachers were talking about it and they were saying, oh yeah, this white boy looks like this little boy in class, uh, his name was Steven, and this little white girl looks just like my friend Amanda. And I and my you know, four-year-old innocence said, you know, where's me? Um, where's someone who looks like me? And so like the teachers went quiet for a second and then one of them said, yeah, you know, we, we could maybe staple you up on the wall. And, you know, again, I'm four. And so like my first thought is, I don't want to be stapled to the wall. <laughs> and my second thought is, you know, even at that young age, I kind of process like, it was, and it was kind of my first realization of this was that I was different. You know, there was something different about me that meant that I couldn't be, you know, a part of this picture on this wall. And, and you know, I, I didn't really understand what I was learning in that moment, but I've had years to contextualize it. And so fast forward, uh, I went back home to the same elementary school to do a, a book reading of my picture book, How to Find a Fox. And so part of it, part of my presentation, I always draw for the kids. And so I've got this pre-kindergarten class and I'm taking requests and one girl asks me to draw a princess. And I start to draw the head in Already, like in my mind, I'm picturing, you know, a Disney princess, you know, pale, blonde, perfect. And I stop myself and I realize I don't have to do that anymore. And so I make a little brown princess with, you know, dark hair, tight, frizzy curls. And one of the teachers, you know, looks at this little black girl that's in the middle of the class and says, she looks just like you. And all that to say that if I do nothing else in this world but give a few brown kids the capacity to envision themselves in stories that traditionally we have not been a part of, um, then I will die happy. Wow. And make me cry. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out. Nala Magruder. David Walker, Brandon Thomas, Joseph P. Illich. I'm Sean Taylor for the Black Comics Arts Festival 2018, our fourth year. I think we went a little bit long today. We have a panel at two o'clock, which you don't want to miss. You have five more minutes? Great, so if we have... No, we have... We'll have in five minutes, we have a panel, so I guess um, we're a little bit over. There are some free Catalyst Prime books to give out, and please stick around for the next panel. We have... Matt Huff, Nettie Orica for Victor Laval, 
will be on that panel. And then the panel at three o'clock this afternoon will be uh, for I am Alfonso Jones. Please stick around for that. And thank you for our second day of VCAP. Thank you very much for coming and, out. And tomorrow. Tomorrow is Expo. the expo at the I have you. Cityville, Metreon. Metreon. Hope to see some of you there. We'll have books for sale. We will. And <laughs> I'll spout wisdom and bitter cynicism <laughs> for free. How unlike you. <laughs> <laughs> and in the room, um, Latin American Book Room, which out there on the corner, we have a showcase. We have some artists. We have Borderland Books, the only San Francisco speculative bookstore that's in there. They have some of their books up there. We have free books. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Good. Yeah, yeah.